Uh, gentlemen and ladies, or opposite ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Pablo Gonzalez Lopez, who is a young neurosurgeon from Alicante, which is uh, the place in the Mediterranean coast of Spain where all the British mobsters live. <laughs> and uh, Pablo is one of the rising stars in European neurosurgery, and uh, his reach is uh, actually worldwide. He's very smart and he's got a little different approach than we all do. Pablo is able to present a silly, boring case as a very interesting one. With all his thinking, his cases are really thought through. It's uh, very elaborate and very excellent. And I always love his uh, lectures and his teaching. And uh, above that, Pablo is an excellent anatomist, both in skull base and in uh, white matter. I, I don't like white matter dissection, but when I want several times past this is Pablo, I enjoyed that, actually, the boring thing. Uh, and today, as I understand, Pablo will give a lecture on anatomy of the skull base and on basic approaches. So Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Salman, for inviting me. Thank you, Vladimir, for your introduction. You will check that uh, that's not completely truth. But I'm very happy to be here and uh, to be part of this of this family. So let me know if uh, I'm sharing properly my screen. I'm trying to. Is that okay? That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let's go. So Salman told me to prepare a few slides about uh, basic skull based anatomy, uh, how we can optimize our surgical approaches in order to get a good result. So this is the workflow in my mind when we are approaching any single case in uh, skull base surgery or brain surgery. And the key and the first step is neuroanatomy. So once we uh, study neuroanatomy, we can study single case and plan an optimal uh, surgical planning. And this is probably uh, theoretically gonna lead us to a better surgical result. When we are talking about the skull, we can divide it into parts. So we have the cranium, and we have the fascial skeleton. And about the cranium, we have the calvarium, which is the upper part. And then we have the skull base, which can be, again, divided in two parts, endo and exocranium. And both of these sides are connected to the nasal cavity, the orbit, the infratemporal and infrapetrosal uh, fossae through some fissures and canals. And this Sorry, is the key. Pablo. Sorry, Pablo. Uh, there, is this, there is this white uh, box in front which says no build defect, start and delay. Is Can you remove that? That's on your screen. Uh, which one, say again? This is on the right side where your skull base arrows are going. So after the arrows, we can't see anything because there's this white uh, box there. Okay, let me try. It says start and delay. You don't, you can't see that box? No, I cannot. Let me know if now it's better. No, it's still there. Mm. Because it's covering um, that, you know, beyond that, uh, those uh, arrows, we can't see what that was. So that's why I'm concerned what that is. I cannot see that. So let me check if I can <coughs> fix it. Any idea, any of you know how to do that? Uh, Imad is looking into it. Is, is there any way that he can get rid of it? Mm. Uh, okay, uh, let's go back. Well, let's go back screen share. Okay. Is it okay now? Uh, it's perfect now. Okay, sorry for that. No, 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 nothing to do with you. Thank you. I couldn't see, even see that. So I was saying that we have the skull base and we have an endocranium, which is the inner aspect, and we have the exocranium, which is the outer aspect. And both sides are connected through fissures and canals to the nasal cavity, mainly orbit, infratemporal and infrapetrosal fossae. So if we, if we have a look to the endocranium, which is the inner aspect of the skull base, we can easily divide it in anterior fossa. We have the middle fossa, and then we have the posterior fossa, each of them related to different parts, like the orbit, we will highlight it, the infratemporal fossa, and the craniocervical junction. So about basic skull base approaches, this is how I try to divide them in my mind. So we do have anterior, which are mainly composed by bifrontal or unifrontal. Then we do have the anterolateral, which are the ones going 
more, mostly anterolaterally, which are uh, FOC, terional, lateral, supraorbital, even supraciliary approach. We have the superolateral approach to the orbit, which means doing a, an unroofing of the orbit and a lateral orbitotomy. Then if we move to the lateral aspect of the skull base, we will highlight the subtemporal with different variations, and the transpetrosal approaches, and the inferolateral approach to the infratemporal fossa. Moving slightly posteriorly, we do have the posterolateral approaches, mainly retrosigmoid and the enough lateral, which is a concept I took from Prof. Benes, not far lateral, but enough lateral. And finally, if we move posteriorly, we do have the posterior approaches, mainly paramedial and lateral suboccipital. So once we have all these approaches in our mind, we have to try to understand which are the important anatomical landmarks, which will give us the key in order to choose one or other approaches. So for that, we have to study bones, canals, foramina, fissures, dural layers, venous sinuses, and neurovascular structures, and their close relationship to any single lesion. Let's start with the anterior fossa. And we have, if we have a superior look at the anterior fossa, we do have three different compartments. The frontal compartment, which are on both sides of the anterior fossa. And in the central aspect, we do have the ethmoid compartment. Just posterior to these two compartments, we do have the esphenoid compartment. So this is a very easy way to classify the anterior fossa. And we can put there all the lesions that are mainly composed by meningiomas. So how we can approach the anterior fossa? So we have anterior roots and anterolateral roots. The anterior roots mainly bifrontal and unifrontal. The anterolateral, we will have mainly the terional, this is the key, and different variations, lateral supraorbital, supraciliary, and FOC. So depending on the kind of tumor and the uh, surgeon's preference, we will choose one or the other. About the anterior, unifrontal approaches. These are mainly approaches which will give us the view of the half of the anterior fossa. So benefits is that we have direct access to the frontal compartment, and we do have direct control of the lateral and ethmoidal feeding arteries. This is good in order to deal with meningiomas like this one, because we will have direct access to the feeding of this tumor. Another advantage is that we can access to a huge flap of periosteum for reconstruction, and then we can drill extensively the floor of the anterior fossa in order to gain space. Bifrontal approach is going to give us a wide panoramic view of the anterior fossa, and we have a direct access to the ethmoidal and frontal compartment. But we have a very, very big problem. First of all, we have to open the frontal sinus. We have to deal with the bringing veins. But the most important problem is that we don't have direct access to the cisterns until the end of the surgery. So this means that we are going to deal with a tight brain because most of, the, of these cases have bifrontal edema. So this is why I don't like this approach too much. On the other hand, we don't have initial control of the very important neurovascular structures, which are, which are hidden behind these tumors. Anterolateral. So we have the supraciliary, which can be performed through an a bro or eyelid incision. And in these cases, uh, people say that we have a very good cosmetic result, but we have to pay that the, 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 the exposure is going to be very, very small. So here we can see how we can take the orbital rim superolaterally, access the anterolateral aspect of the anterior fossa. But the problem is that we don't have access to the central compartment. We don't have access to the ethmoidal compartment because it's too low compared to the frontal compartment. We can have a good reconstruction with cosmetic result, but this is not the approach I would do in my uh, cases. Important ones, lateral supraorbital. It's a small variation of the terional, and the benefit is that uh, we are mostly preserving the frontal sinus, frontal paranasal sinus. We have a good cosmetic and functional result, and it's uh, a debate if we can uh, preserve the contralateral or olfactory nerve. The benefit is that we are going to have direct access before approaching the tumor, we are going to have direct access to the cisterns so we can release CSF and relax the brain and we'll have direct control of the neurovascular structures. But the key of these anterolateral approaches is the terional approach. This is the most common one and probably the best one by far. So the terional approach starts with this question mark incision. We do have different craniotomies in size and shape 
but something important is to try to gain anterior exposure. So for that, we can do this interfascial or subfascial dissection of the temporalis muscle. Important to know that the frontal branches of the fascial nerve are in between this fat pad. So once we do the skin incision, we try to preserve the superficial temporal fascia. And then as we are going downwards, we try to identify this fat pad and dissect it. So once we dissect and push away this fat pad, we can preserve these frontal branches. Then we try to dissect in this way the temporalis muscle in order to preserve the vascularization, trying to keep the pericranium integrum. We perform our approach. And I always like to, to leave a small part of the bone in order to avoid it pushes the dura once we take the bone flap. And something important is to drill as much as we can in anterior clinoid or esphenoid wing meningiomas, this esphenoid wing. Then we open the dura, and this is one of the best benefits. We can access the systems, we can split the cilium fissure in case we need it, release some CSF, and approach the feeding of these tumors. So first we start the vascularizing the tumor, dissecting, debulking, devascularizing, dissecting, debulking. This is the key. So once we can uh, the vascularize and remove the tumor, we can unroof, in this case, like in this case, the optic canal. Well, <clears throat> let's move a little bit posteriorly. And this is the region we were highlighting. This is the anterior clinoid in the center, which is a very important structure because as you can see, it's dividing different uh, bony compartments and very important uh, canals and fissures. So this is a scheme of the anterior clinoid, which is number one, which is uh, connected to the tuberculum cellae, which is number four, through the optic strut, which is number two. And this optic strut is separating two important canals. Upwards, we do have the optic canal, and laterally and inferiorly, we have the superior orbital fissure, which is connecting the middle fossa with the orbit, and the optic canal is going directly to the orbit. So orbit anatomy and approaches. Here you can see a tumor. Uh, this lady came after one year of uh, uh, diagnosis of neuritis, optic neuritis, but finally it was a, a, a meningioma and the patient was completely blind on this right side. So this tumor is growing in the optic nerve. So it can potentially, potentially reach the anterior fossa, the intracranial space. So what we do have in the orbit is mainly fat, surrounded by the periorbit. If we remove the fat, we can see the neurovascular structures with the optic nerve in the center and the very important, important ophthalmic artery and all the muscles and nerves surrounding these structures. So these are the muscles. We do have seven muscles, as you know, in the orbit and all of them are situated uh, circumferentially around the globe and the optic nerve. And these are the, all the different approaches to the orbit, but from our uh, perspective, uh, the, the most important ones is those ones which are superolateral, which are uh, involving tumors that can connect to the intracranial space, which means connecting the orbit to the intracranial space through the optic canal or through the superior orbital fissure. So what does a superolateral approach to the orbit means? So we are combining our anterolateral roots, mainly the terional, with a superolateral orbitotomy. So then we can expose all these neurovascular structures from the orbit to the intracranial space. And this is what we did in this case because we wanted to remove the intraorbital part of the optic nerve and also to cut the optic nerve at the level of the chiasm in order to prevent the growing of this tumor to the contralateral optic nerve. So after doing a terional approach, classic terional approach, we do our keyhole connecting the orbit and the anterior fossa we drill the esphenoid wing, as you can see, and we want to unroof the optic canal, which is right there. That's the optic canal. So once we do that, we open the periorbit after removing the roof and the lateral wall, and we can access this optic nerve, which is completely insufflated, as you can see. So we identify the globe, and just posterior to the globe, we cut the optic nerve, and we cut it as posterior as we can. So the tumor is removed now, and then we open the dura to cut the optic nerve inside in order to prevent the growing of the tumor. So we are sending two different pieces to pathology, and luckily in this case, 
the intracranial part of the optic nerve was completely free of tumor. So this is the cosmetic result two weeks later. So the, the result is quite good and we cut it completely, the intraorbital part of this optic nerve with this terional superolateral orbitotomy approach. But the tumors can grow not only through the optic canal inside the orbit, but also through the superior orbital fissure. And this is the classic picture. This is a sphenoorbital tumor, which is growing in the dura of the middle fossa and invading the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. This superior orbital fissure is mainly uh, crossed by neurovascular, important neurovascular structures. And the annulus of sin, which is an intraorbit uh, tendon, uh, it's a kind of passage through which some important nerves and arteries are crossing, as you can see. And outside this uh, uh, annulus of sin, we have V1, we have the fourth nerve, superior ophthalmic vein, and the inferior ophthalmic vein. But important structures crossing the annulus of sin are the optic nerve, ophthalmic artery, third cranial nerve, and the sixth cranial nerve. So this is, these are structures that we must preserve when we are approaching this kind of sphenoorbital tumors. And this is why, uh, at least personally, I'm leaving a part of the tumor, a small part of the tumor, inside the annulus of sin. So in order to expose uh, these two different compartments of these sphenoorbital meningiomas, I only can think about one approach, and this is the frontoorbitozygomatic. And in, in, in fact, for me, this is the only indication uh, in my hands for a frontoorbitozygomatic approach. And I do it in three pieces. First of all, we do a terional approach, then we remove the zygoma, and then we remove the superolateral aspect of the orbit. So after doing the terional and, uh, approach and the zygomatic arc removal, we are drilling the esphenoid wing, identifying menor meningo orbital band, cutting it, and this is very important because this is the passage we have to expose the superior orbital fissure intracranially. Then we do our orbitotomy superiorly and laterally in order to take it in one piece if possible. Once we have dissected the periorbit, we do this orbital rim removal, and then we have connected the intracranial and intraorbital spaces. We drill a little bit more in case we need it. Then we open the dura, remove the intracranial part of this meningioma until the superior orbital fissure. And then it's when we open the periorbit to remove the intraorbital component. So with this approach, we are leaving a small part of the tumor in the annulus of sin that we won't want to touch. So with this uh, removal, the patient improved. So his vision improved a lot. You can see the compression of the optic nerve and how easily is the compressed after this exposure. So you can see in this picture with these three pieces frontal orbitozygomatic approach, and I want to highlight that, this is the only indication in my hands for this uh, approach. So let's jump to the middle fossa from the anterior fossa. And the middle fossa is very interesting, especially in the lateral, in the medial wall, because we do have the cavernous sinus. But about the bones, we do have an anterior part given by the greater esphenoid wing, a temporal bone with its petrous component posteriorly. So these three different parts, these three different bones can give us a nice division of the middle fossa. So we have an anterior part and a posterior part. And talking about approaches, we can divide them on lateral and anterolateral routes. Anterolateral, we know them, terional approach, going a little bit more vasally in order to perform a pretemporal exposure of the anterior aspect of the middle fossa. And in case the lesion is too posterior, we can combine it or just do a subtemporal approach, which is a lateral route. Anterolateral routes, terional approach, going quite basal. If, if we can, we have to reach the floor of the middle fossa. This is the key. And it can give us a wide and nice exposure in order to take meningiomas like this, which were growing intracranially in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. But we also have the lateral routes. These are giving us a more posterior exposure. And the most important one is the subtemporal approach. Sometimes we have some tumors which are growing to the extracranial aspect through the uh, foramen ovale or foramen rotundum. And in these cases, we have to try to take the zygoma because then we can combine our subtemporal with an infratemporal exposure. And this is the case uh, of tumors like this meningioma, which are growing intra and extracranially. 
So with this subtemporal, infratemporal route, after doing our question mark incision, we go quite down to the posterior root of zygoma. We do our interfacial dissection in order to expose the zygomatic arc. So now we are planning the cutting of the zygoma to connect infra, temporal, and subtemporal exposures. So we are marking here where we want to place the, the screw later on, and then we can cut it. We can leave it together with a masseterian muscle, or we can remove it. I prefer to leave it with a masseterian muscle. And then we push it <coughs> downwards, and the tumor is right there. So we are dissecting the temporalis muscle, and this is a tumor growing in the infratemporal fossa. So we are removing this part of, the, of this anaplastic meningioma. This is the subtemporal craniotomy going downwards to the floor of the middle fossa. And the aim is to connect the middle fossa with the infratemporal fossa. So once we drill the floor of the middle fossa, we can access the most important panel. This is V3. You can see V3 here. So it means that we have reached the most medial part of this tumor. But most likely, tumors in the middle fossa stay in the middle fossa. That's very important. And for that, for example, this trigeminal schwannoma, we do prefer the subtemporal approach. And in these cases, the anatomy is key. So once we have done the subtemporal craniotomy, it's very important, first of all, to identify our lateral landmarks. V3 in the foramen ovale and the meningeal middle meningeal artery through the foramen spinosum. So something important is to understand that at this level, the dura has two layers, and this is incorrect. We should try to do our peeling of the layers. Otherwise, we are going to put at risk the fascial nerve because we can track from the geniculate ganglion. So it's important, and the, uh, a good trick is to go to the middle fossa, identify the middle meningeal artery, coagulate it quite basally, and then trying to split both layers of the dura in the middle fossa. Let me show you how we do it. This is the question mark incision. We are cutting the temporalis muscle. Again, we try to keep the vascularization. This is the posterior root of zygoma. So just above it, we do a bar hole. We do our subtemporal craniotomy. We try to drill the lateral part so as to have a good vessel view. And this is the foramen spinosum with the middle meningeal artery. So that's where we start doing our peeling of the middle fossa. That's the tumor lateral to the gasserian ganglion. We open its capsule and we can take it out. So this is the middle fossa, but you can see how part of the tumor is going to the posterior fossa. So this is the part of the tumor going to the posterior fossa through the trigeminal nerve trajectory. So this is the gasserian ganglion after the removal. This was the bed of this trigeminal schonoma. This is V1, V2, and V3. So you can see how we were connecting middle and posterior fossa through this subtemporal approach. The difference or the, the, the limit in between the middle fossa and the posterior fossa is the petrous bone. So uh, some approaches to the petrous bone are quite, quite uh, interesting. But as you can see, the petrous bone has this pyramidal shape. If we go from lateral to medial, from the base to the apex of this pyramid, the surface or the volume of the petrous bone is going to diminish going medially, and the number of important neurovascular structures is increasing. So the message is try to stay in the posterior part. This is what I am trying to do, which means the mastoid segment of the petrous bone where we only have these air cells and a very important structure, which is the fascial nerve. So here we do have the mastoid segment of the fascial nerve. So this approach, this transpetrosal approach, which, which is also a lateral, purely lateral route, can give us a good access to tumors like this cholesteatoma, which are growing in the mastoid segment of this petrous bone. So important in this case to identify the mastoid segment of this fascial nerve. So we are doing a bar hole in the asterium, that's the mastoid. We are going anteriorly. This patient was operated when she was a kid for this cholesteatoma. We are trying to drill the mastoid in this triangular shape. And at this point, we are stimulating with the drill and with a normal monopolar probe in order to try to identify where is the mastoid segment of the fascial nerve. 
so as to preserve it. So we can get responses with all our instruments. We remove the cholesteatoma and we should go all the way down to the jugular fossa. It is the medial limit and inferior limit of this cholesteatoma. So we are finding also responses of the glossopharyngeal nerve. With this speculum, we can even try to get to the hidden corners to remove this part of the cholesteatoma. And we are trying to track the fascial nerve. That's the glossopharyngeal nerve, which means that we have reached the last part of this cholesteatoma. We try to reconstruct it with spongostan, some tissue gold, and always fat. And we play some titanium plates for reconstruction. So this is the transpetrosal approach, and this is the main indication in my mind, mastoid uh, tumors. So let's jump to the posterior fossa, from the middle fossa, and you can see that the step we have to, to go through is the petrous bone. So if we have a look at the posterior fossa from the exocranium, we have the occipital bone dividing the clival part, condylar part, and the squamous part. So all the approaches are going to go through these different windows. If we have a superior view of the posterior fossa, important structure is the tentorium, which is separating the infra from the supratentorial spaces, and very important to know where the sinuses are located. So here we can see the torcula with the two transverse sinuses, superior and inferior uh, petrosal sinuses that are, they are all connected inside the dural layers. Which are the most common approaches to the posterior fossa? Very simple. Posterolateral or posterior? Posterolateral, let's say retrosigmoid and enough lateral, posterior roots, we have the suboccipital approach, which can be purely midline and or we can go paramedial. About the retrosigmoid, there are some important landmarks. This is how we place the patients in lateral position. We identify posterior root of zygoma, inion, and in between them, we track a perpendicular line from the digastric groove at the level of the mastoid. So the point in which they cross is mostly related to the junction of the sigmoid and transverse sinuses. So we do have uh, this semicircular incision, and we always try to identify where the asterium is located, but because that's where we are going to place our first and single bar hole. So we dissect the skin flap and muscles. In case we find the occipital artery, we try to coagulate it before cutting. So we have a good exposure. You can see the sutures occipital, mastoid, parietomastoid, and lamboid, and the junction is the asterion where we place our bar hole. This is a little bit posterior to the junction of the sinuses, but you can see here the lateral or transverse sinus, and then we do our craniotomy, going all the way down. We don't go too anterior in case we need to extend it. We just drill it and place some bone wax. Important landmarks. Once we open the dura, these tubing and lines are giving us the relative location of the floor of the internal acoustic meatus. So we can drill it safely, so we can identify where the fascial and vestibulocochlear nerves are located in the inner aspect. Enough lateral. This enough lateral is an extension of our lateral suboccipital or retrosigmoid approach, which gives us a much more vassal and anterior exposure. So I used to do this incision, which is a sigmoid incision instead of the, the classic autistic one. It works better for me because the retractors of the, of the soft tissues are uh, properly positioned and give me more space. So these uh, tumors, uh, the, these two approaches, posterolateral roots, retrosigmoid or enough lateral, are mainly indicated for cerebropontine angle lesions, retrosigmoid are, and for cranio cervical junction tumors, mostly in a lateral. So retrosigmoid approach for this meningioma, which is just anterior to the trigeminal nerve. So once we open the dura, we have a wide access to the cerebropontine angle. This is a supramatal tuberculum that sometimes we have to drill in order to gain anterior exposure. Seven nerve, fifth nerve, you can see how compressed it's that nerve. So we have to try to drill this supramatal tubercle in order to get a good exposure and to relax the trigeminal nerve before starting the dissection. So we are again coagulating and debulking. So the vascularize and debulk superiorly and inferiorly to this trigeminal nerve. We can use the endoscope. In this case, it was very useful to identify the sixth nerve before cutting the dural implant of this meningioma. So here we have the sixth nerve quite far away from the tumor so we can safely cut it and try to preserve all these neurovascular structures. 
how we can reach tumors in the craniocervical junction, which are quite anterior, uh, like this meningioma, which was growing uh, anterolaterally in the, at the level of the foramen magnum. So the best way is to perform this far lateral or enough lateral approach. And as you can see, it's a combination of retrosigmoid, extended retrosigmoid, together with the removal of the ME lamina of C1 and trying to drill as much lateral as we need. This is why uh, Vladimir likes to use the terminology of enough lateral. So once we have done our craniotomy, we are extending the lateral exposure. So this is the ME lamina, that's the uh, vertebral foramen. And we are now drilling the lateral aspect of the foramen magnum, trying to reach the condyle. But in most of the cases, in my, in my hands, luckily I have never used the transcondylar approach. I, I didn't need it. So once we open the dura with this approach, we have a very, very good anterolateral view. So we can devascularize this meningioma with this approach. Here is important to highlight C1 and accessory nerves that must be dissected. This is the dentate ligament. We must cut it to have a wide access. We are covering the important nerves and arteries, and we start debulking. So once we devascularize, this is the kind of color this tumor has. It's very, very gentle. So again, we have the nerves. This is the accessory nerve. That's C1. So we are going vasally. And once it, it's devascularized, the tumor is much more comfortable to be developed. We are going now up, just inferior to this pica distal branches. And the final part of this tumor, which is the most superior part, we can dissect it and again, trying to devascularize. So that's the vertebral artery, and this is the pica. In this case, we needed to do this, this reconstruction. It's a 75 years old lady with hemiparesis that improved a lot, and we were very happy with the result. We placed this titanium plate in order to protect it. So you can see that there is no need to drill the condyle in some of these, of these cases, and this is important to, to analyze individually all of our tumors. So last ones, posterior roots to the posterior fossa. So we said before that we can go purely through the midline or we can use a paramedial suboccipital approach and it depends of the relative location of the tumor. So for uh, tumors in the fourth ventricle and in the midline of the uh, cerebellum, uh, we do prefer the, the midline suboccipital approach. So as this tumor located in the fourth ventricle, this is a sitting position, which is quite, quite comfortable. So the tumor is going through the foramen of Magendi to the cisterna magna. So with this purely midline approach, we have a wide exposure of the vermis and the telotonsillar fissures, which are important in some cases to be dissected to gain exposure laterally and superiorly. We are trying to dissect the capsule from the bellum, so superior and inferior telacoroidea. That's the aqueduct of Silvius. This is the, the upper part of the, of the lesion. And with the speculum, again, we can check that some remnants of the tumor were upwards. We are now going now to the right side, to the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle, trying to dissect again the capsule. <clears throat> and once we remove it, we can use the 45 degree endoscope to check that the posterior aspect is clean. The floor of the fourth ventricle is clean, but there was a small remnant in the roof of the fourth ventricle. So with the aid of the speculum, we can even take it out and check that all the nerves are working, working properly. Well, this is the purely midline suboccipital approach, but for lesions which are mainly in the lateral aspect of the cerebellum or even in the supracerebellar space or pineal lesions, we do prefer this paramedial suboccipital approach, which is much faster. For this stoma, before opening the dura, we release the pressure placing that cannula in the cystic component, and then we approach the supracerebral space. In this case, we use some ICG to check where is the artery and where is the vein of this small hemangioblastoma, so we can optimize our resection directly attacking the feeding arteries and performing a circumferential resection of this small hemangioblastoma. This is the tent, and we can do this circumferential dissection of this small tumor with a huge cyst. 
So just to summarize, these are all the approaches we have been discussing and related to the important anatomical structures of the skull base. So we have anterior, anterolateral, lateral, posterolateral, posterior. But I highlighted the three most important ones. Terional, with different variations, can give us a good access to the anterior and middle fossa. Retosigmoid is going to give us a very, very good exposure of the cerebellopontine angle, and the suboccipital is going to give us a good exposure of the posterior aspect of the posterior fossa. So neuroanatomy, again, is very important, studying the individual anatomy of every single case, understanding the location of the lesion in the skull base and important anatomical landmarks is, is going to give us enough information to choose the most appropriate approach and always very important to check in your mind that the anatomical identification of these landmarks is working properly with us. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pablo. That was wonderful. Is, is Vlad, are you there with us? You're back. Yeah, I am. I okay, think that is a pleasure. That's great, Pablo. You have forgotten one of the most important approaches, obviously, but I'm not uh, sure. I, I, I would excuse you for that. <laughs> you know which, which one? one I mean. It's supra infra yeah, which, which allows you the yeah. great approach everywhere. So you, can, you, you, you can talk us about that because it's a, an extension of the, let's say, lateral suboccipital. It is. It's an extension. Well, I would say that the retrosic is extension of supra infra. Okay. You can take it vice versa, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> What I also appreciated very much, Pablo, that uh, what you said that uh, this orbitozygomatic is reserved for very specific cases in your hand. Uh, I, I, I really believe that I, I cannot remember when I did it last time, 20 years ago, probably. You don't need that. Only in my mind for sphenoorbital orbital meningiomas, by definition, because like, you need frontotemporal exposure and you need exactly. orbital exposure. Yeah. That's I'm just drilling it down all of it, and uh, the end result is this approach, actually. I mean, you are treating the tumor with the drilling. Right. This exactly. tumor is amazing. Exactly. So the approach is the treatment, actually. That's it. That's it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very good. You, Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Salman? Yes, uh, Vlad. So we have a few questions here. I think we start with uh, some questions that you know some people are throwing at you. There are many people who are actually praising the pictures that you had and the cartoons that you had with the uh, MR and the approaches that you have, which was wonderful. I think the anatomy comes very nicely now with this new gadgets, and it's it's really really nice nowadays to see such nice gadgets. And you know, I think it, everybody's appreciative of that. Uh, there's a question that what is your what is your preferred approach for a trigeminal schwannoma? So it depends generally of the, 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 the component, the main component of the tumor, because I have done some tumors uh, with a retosigmoid approach, which were those ones in which the, the most uh, voluminous component was growing in the posterior fossa. But some cases, but in some cases, we do have the most uh, voluminous part of the tumor in the uh, Meckel's cave. So in these cases, I go subtemporal. But generally, I, if I can, I prefer to go retrosigmoid. And what about uh, vestibular schwannoma? Would you go the same, or uh, it depends on how big it is or how small it is? So let's say I have done like 55, 60 uh, vestibular schwannomas, and in all of them, all of them, I have gone through the retroschemoid approach. Only one case, in fact, we did it last month, I had to go through the subtemporal uh, aspect. Because the tumor, this is the first time I saw that, and this is why I think it was a fascial schwannoma. The tumor was growing mainly in the middle fossa and all the way through the internal acoustic meatus to the posterior fossa. But it was a five centimeters tumor in the middle fossa. So only in that case I went uh, subtemporal. And this is why I believe it was a fascial schwannoma. The patient had grade five before surgery. And uh, uh, by definition, a vestibular schwannoma cannot grow in the middle fossa, in my mind. But the fascial nerve is going through the geniculate ganglion to the floor of the middle fossa. So retrosigmoid for vestibular schwannomas. No translabyrinthic approach. And it do you have any... Not, not the true uh, schwannoma. Uh, it was like a distal nerve. Or... 
community. It was growing. The middle of it must have been the origin must have been elsewhere. Well, the the the, the tumor. The thing is that it was uh, growing since 2013. 2013. In 2013, the ENT surgeons in another city did a biopsy, and uh, it was Shanoma that did a trans labyrinthic biopsy. The tumor was only in the internal acoustic meatus at that time. And then the patient went home, and five years later, he started having facial palsy and trigeminal pain. And once we did the MRI, the tumor was five centimeters in the middle fossa. Let's say all the internal acoustic meatus was occupied and only one centimeter in the CPA. Mm -hmm. So it's quite rare. But uh, I guess it was growing initially in the fascial nerve inside the internal acoustic meatus, and it went, or, e, or maybe the ENT surgeons opened the internal acoustic meatus roof, so it could grow. I don't know. I don't know. The pathologists didn't tell, tell us that it was fascial or vestibular. <laughs> cannot, of course. Uh, what, 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 what's, uh, you, you did never mentioned Kawase approach. Do you see any place for that? Uh, I never did it, and I hope I don't have to do that one. Uh, the most similar thing to Kawase is, is when you are doing the subtemporal approach to a big trigeminal shonoma, but the trigeminal shonoma did the Kawase for you. Yep. So you don't yep. need to do it so much. Shonoma does the approach. Yeah. Do you go extradurally for this or intradurally for this? I try to do it extradural. Extradural. Yep. You can use that. Uh, I know this. I took this from you. The, this external lumbar drainage for the exactly. Helps. You use it a lot. Uh, always, always. Okay, we have more question. We have Peter who's asking when do we use the retro lab approach or trans lab approach for CP angle lesion, and is it safe to cut cut the superior petrosal <laughs> vein uh, during this? Well. Uh, I have done it, I must recognize, I, I have done it in some petroclival meningiomas, only for some petroclival meningiomas. And I never have found any problem uh, ligating the superior petrosal sinus, luckily, but this is a crazy approach. And uh, it takes like five hours, four or five hours of drilling in order to gain, let's say, five more millimeters of the anterior aspect. So the last ones I have done, I, I use a retrosigmoid approach and it worked very well. It worked very well. Okay, then there is a question about anterior. Sorry, Lime. sorry, uh, let go on. Uh, what about the petrosal vein in this? Then the for, vein. You mean uh, for, for petroclivals? For petroclivals with uh, transpetrosal, you mean, or with no, 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 the, the retrosic. Well, if the petroclival is meningioma is huge, uh, sometimes you cannot even find this, the, the, the dandy's vein because probably it has been compressed and the, there has been a reorganization of the of the blood flow. But when the tumor is uh, small, you can see that. And generally, you see it posterior to the tumor. So personally, I try to preserve it if I can. And in most of the cases, you can you can try to, to do so. so. I prefer to preserve it. I have seen some disasters after not so much, but I have seen some. I have one disaster. <laughs> Everyone did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there is another question about your anterior clenoid process drilling for optic nerve decompression. Um, so Robin is saying that he has done few and because he feels that he had uh, worsening and there was nerve palsy, so third nerve palsy, and he's saying that, you know, it was that because of traction or what, did he do anything different? What's your opinion? Uh, he was doing know. clenoid drilling and he had this uh, issues in a couple yeah. of patients. Uh, maybe it's, it's I, I, I don't think it's due to the drilling. Uh, third nerve is a little bit uh, inferior it to it probably. It was due to the heat of the bipolar or something else. But the, the, mm. in my mind, it doesn't fit that just drilling the anterior <laughs> clinoid gives you to, to, to get a, a third cranial nerve palsy. Probably there's something else. Or even sometimes when you, you, you take the clinoid off, uh, you can have uh, some bleeding from the cavernous sinus. Maybe you are packing or bipolaring, and then you can have the, the, the palsy. I, I'm sure Vladimir has some more thoughts about that. I have not done it too much. You, you can never cut dura uh, laterally from the slope of the 
you stay in anterior fossa. You can never go into the middle fossa, uh, drilling the, uh, cutting the dura in anterior clinoid uh, meningioma, for instance. Once you get behind this uh, temporal corner, then you can damage the sad nerve. As you say, it's hidden, but still you can get there if you are cutting the dura of the uh, the tumor origin. You cut it from frontal uh, side only. You never want to get laterally onto the temporal slope because there it's in between the two layers of the between the two layers exactly, exactly. Do do you open the optic canal in or tuberculum cell meningiomas? In which meningioma? Sorry. The tuberculum cell, cell meningiomas. Generally, I do it before. I try to do it before uh, I attempt any resection. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because sometimes uh, you can see how the optic nerve is compressed. And if you start mobilizing the tumor, you can compress it a little bit more. So I prefer to, to relax it just for maneuvers. Just for maneuvers. And then anterior clinoid meningioma? Uh, generally, I do it, but not intentionally. So, I mean, I try to drill so as to get a good uh, uh, view of the of the feeder. So I coagulate the dura there, and uh, okay. unexpectedly, it comes with a, a, an unroofing of the optic canal. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, before, be sorry, before we proceed, just this is for uh, tomorrow. The uh, World Federation of Neurological Societies uh, Spine Committee has this uh, webinar with the PSN tomorrow. Uh, and this is at um, uh, six o'clock Istanbul time and uh, uh, five o'clock, I think, uh, or eight o'clock Karachi time, I think. Five o'clock Karachi time. So I think this is uh, scheduled for tomorrow. And then we have on uh, Friday, uh, we have uh, KK Turrell, and I think he's talking about his usual complications. Uh, <laughs> so, so he, he a a or? <laughs> so so his his talk is on Friday, and this is uh, twelve um, noon in Karachi, which is same morning time like today, and that's for Friday. And KK Turrell is uh, is is going to keep us entertained. Um, then we also have a um, talk of um, uh, Paolo Pereira, and that's on, on Sunday, that's on spine. And he's going to be um, uh, talking about uh, um, something to do with MIS uh, related uh, surgeries uh, in spine. So we have this entertainment, but we'll carry on with the questions. And the next question is, where do we use the OZ approach? Uh, in your case, is it for a uh, large clinoid meninge or for high riding basilar? Where do you use it? Generally, as, I, as we were discussing before, uh, I have only used it uh, four cases, if I remember well, which were all sphenoorbital meningiomas, all of them. With uh, Some of them were invading also the, the clinoid side, mm -hmm. but mainly sphenoorbital meningiomas, right? Only in those cases. But I know many people are using it for basilar aneurysms and, and so on. I have been lucky, I, I never had to do that. Vlad, you? Vlad is quiet. Vlad, you have to, sorry. Unmute. You have to activate your, yeah. I, yeah, That's I it. did. Uh, I, I never use it. I did, uh, did it probably some 20 years ago, my last one. Uh, the indication would be, Either craniopharyngioma or basilar tip aneurysm, which is high above the posterior glyanoid processes. Then you need a little more of an angle. But the, now when I have a basilar tip aneurysm and it's so high up, I use endovascular. So I, I, I don't see any use for this uh, uh, approach. You know, The approach must not be more difficult than the lesion itself. OK, so the next question is uh, from uh, this is from Kartik uh, Multani, and his question is, what's the advantage of NF lateral, a transcondylar approach versus extended endoscopic transphenoidal approach for anteriorly located CVJ mass? So would you come anteriorly endoscopic or would you prefer uh, doing uh, enough lateral? I, I don't have uh, enough... Uh, uh, um, uh, cases to, 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 to answer a question like this, 
but I'm not doing uh, endoscopic approaches. Uh, we have a, a, a colleague in the department, Javier Abarca, who is doing these cases in an excellent way. So in all these kind of controversial cases, I first ask him, and most of them are uh, being done nowadays with the endoscopic uh, approaches, transfenoidal, transclival, transcondylar, if you want to do, to do so. It's, it's much safer. Uh, nowadays, and uh, with guys like him with expertise, I think there is no way to to do a big, big open uh, skull based approach. Vlad, yourself? Uh, the question was about the CC junction meningiomas, anterior located. Uh, yeah. we, we never do them via, with uh, endo endoscopes because uh, I have never seen a tumor where the spinal cord would be like a U shaped posteriorly to the tumor. So you always have some space from either side to reach the tumor. And inaflateral is the proper approach for almost all of them. I cannot remember a tumor which cannot be resected with this inaflateral. And uh, the point in inaflateral is that uh, you do not really need to resect the condyle too much because you can work above and below the condyle. Just avoid the condyle, go from above, and then go from below above the vertebral arteries. The difficult meningiomas are those which are above the vertebral artery. Then you have the 12th nerve, you have all, all the 9th, 10th, 11th, but uh, ne never endo endoscopically. Sorry, I, I do agree with you, but I understood that uh, generally for a clival or condyle a tumor, uh, for CC meningiomas, I do agree. But for huge chordomas, for instance, in the clival... No, no, chordomas are different uh, animal. I saw that the question was for meningiomas. Sorry, sorry. So I do agree with you also. Yeah, for chordomas are uh, obvious, obvious. Okay, so another question for jugular foramen tumors. What's the preferred approach for you? So in this case, it's again in F lateral. is giving you a good control of all the CPA all the way down to the CC. So uh, we combine, we can combine them with the extracranial exposure easily with the skin. So you have both sides under control. So an enough lateral with this sigmoid uh, incision uh, we are doing can give you a good access to both the intracranial and extracranial aspects. Okay, what about, uh, what's your best approach for tuberculum cell meningioma? And uh, what's your experience with biofrontal versus uh, unilateral supraorbital approach? So uh, my experience is quite simple because I always do terional for this tuberculum cell. For tuberculum cell, I, I never went uh, uh, subfrontal, never. Ipsi and why is that? Contra. Say again. Ipsi or contra. They never are truly midline. They always <laughs> have some uh, uh, yeah. side preference. Which side do you use? So generally, I go through the ipsilateral, which is usually the, the most damaged optic nerve. So I, I, I prefer to go ipsilateral. But I know there is a, a big debate about that. What about you? Contra. Always contra. <laughs> because you better reach the uh, underneath the contralateral optic nerve. The most difficult part is underneath the ipsilateral optic nerve. Yeah, that's, so that I have to shoot. individual. Whatever no, it's, it's a perfect point. It's a perfect point. You don't have to to drill so much in that case because you you have direct access to the inferior aspect and medial right. aspect. That's good. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay. Another question is: What kind of surgeries that you used to do open big surgeries ten years ago that now are being done minimally invasive? And which surgeries you would prefer to do minimally invasive, and which ones are still open? Well, ten years ago I was a resident, so I was doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'll we'll put it to Vlad then. <laughs> oh no, no, let Pablo answer that. <laughs> So, so the thing is that, I'm, as I told you, I'm not doing endoscopic cases, but the thing is that I have done two chordomas uh, seven years ago. I did crazy transpetrosal approaches, and uh, that was uh, terrible. So after those cases, uh, we are doing all of them uh, transphenoidally. This is the, 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 the best example of the shift. 
Okay, very good. And Vlad, in your institution, how many open and how many uh, still uh, mega Vlad surgeries? Ah, it's like, like uh, 30 percent uh, endo and 70 percent uh, transcranial. Cordomas, uh, whenever possible, I do them open. I had uh, two last week and uh, with open surgery, you can drill the bone uh, in a much more controlled way. So whenever the, it's not midline and the purely cell or retro, retro cell tumor, then uh, always open because you have, in, in my hands, I have better control of the bone. Okay. Uh, there's a question about tuberculum cell meningioma, that deterioral approach. Can you tell us your steps? As, because this is a resident asking a question. Uh, can you tell us your, the steps that you take to ensure that you don't cause any problems to the neural structures? So as uh, I think it, it should be Vlad who should ask, uh, answer this, this question. But anyway, I will take his message. He did that. He is doing contralateral because uh, he can get a much better view of the uh, invasion of the optic canal in the most damaged uh, nerve. So something important is to have a, a wide basal exposure and to drill quite enough the esphenoid wing so you can access the, uh, the anterior fossa floor easily. So uh, usually as I go ipsilateral, the first thing I do uh, intradurally or extradurally is to unroof the optic nerve to cut the falciform ligament so as to release the pressure on the, on the ipsilateral optic nerve. And then I start the vascularizing the, the tumor after that. And after the vascularizing, uh, we debug and try to dissect all the neurovascular structures. Okay, and how to how to protect those neurovascular structures once you've done that? Once you're taking the tumor out? That's the question they're asking. Well, uh, how to protect them? Yeah. From what? I, I don't know. Yeah, how to dissect it away from the tumor itself? That's the question they're asking. Well, the, the is there any trick? If we, talking, if we are talking about many geomas, the, the key is to, yeah. to identify the arachnoid. Okay. Identify the arachnoid. So once you identify the arachnoid plane, uh, by definition, unless the tumor has broken this layer, which is quite quite uncommon in most of the cases, uh, that you have a barrier in between the neurovascular structures and the tumor itself. So arachnoid. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Can I, okay, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to add something to that. that. That is the main difference between the skull-based surgery and vascular surgery. In vascular surgery and aneurysms, you are below the arachnoid. It's subarachnoid space. In uh, meningiomas, you lift the arachnoid. You always try to preserve the arachnoid layer. OK. Is it, Pablo, do you agree? I do agree. How yeah, can no. I take? <laughs> 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 OK. Uh, Led, can you see the screen? No, I, I see the plan. I yeah, so the, the plan is, can you see on the 22nd, your name is there. <laughs> AVM and cavernomas. Okay, what do you want? AVMs or cavernomas? What cavernomas. would you like to talk about? Uh, it doesn't matter. I love both. I only have problems with videos, Salman, because I have a weak connection at home for my, uh, for, for, so videos, I probably would upload it somewhere for you. Yeah, I think what we could do is you could either send it to uh, Imad, my secretary, and he can upload all the videos for you. He can prepare it for you. Okay, give him my mail and I shall get in touch with him to, to, to discuss the uh, logistics. Very well. Okay, so, so, so we'll do that. I can have both, but the both, is, uh, both together would be too long. Let's make it either or. No, if okay. we should upload video, then AVMs would be best. So okay. let's let's do AVM and we can do cavernomas again. And um, you know, we will. Uh, Pablo, can you come on that as well? Can you um, help us uh, uh, dissect whatever Vlad teaches us on that day? Twenty second. No of course, I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Pablo. Um, uh, is there any question, Vlad? You would like to ask Pablo? There's one last question from uh, one of the residents. Is how did you train in neuroanatomy and what is the best way of learning anatomy, clinical anatomy for neurosurgeons? Well, I must recognize I had a, a weak point when I was a resident, as I think all the residents, because we are clinically working and we do have a, a lab in the place in which I was trained. 
but we didn't have so much time to, to go there. So what I did in my training program was to take advantage of my rotations. And I decided to go to some places where they had a good lab. And once I finished my, my training, I was very lucky that I was accepted in Istanbul with Prof. Uh, Ugur Ture. Uh, he has a beautiful lab there. So I spent one year with, with, with him, mainly working in the lab. So doing my own projects and projects with him. But the, the key is to work under the microscope. You can see the microscope we have here in the, in the, in the office. And to spend time doing dissections and uh, mainly uh, adapting yourself to work with the, with the scope while you are learning anatomy. That's the key. Once, once you finish doing a three, four months of lab, you can see a, an MRI or a CT scan and you see completely different uh, things there. Do what, uh, what I believe. Okay, brilliant. So, you know, everybody is thanking here that you've done a great job. Um, and um, all this will be shared on YouTube. So this will be on YouTube and uh, Imad will put up that link so that people can see all this because some of this uh, might be too, uh, for R1 and R2, the first few, few years are difficult to understand when you're seeing case after case, but I think you just made it look so easy. Um, I think it's wonderful. Vlad, your last comments before we close. Well, I, I, I believe, <laughs> Yes, thank you, Salman. I believe that Pablo has shown uh, the important part, in, uh, especially for, for residents. Uh, what you said about one year with Ugurtura in a lab, that's probably the most important. It's more important than the clinical work. It's more important than the uh, OR teaching. Uh, the lab is uh, really the basics for anatomy. And uh, Pablo is the best example that the uh, good knowledge of anatomy is the basis of uh, neurosurgery. Brilliant. So I'm grateful. Uh, Pablo, last few words from you and let's close then. Two words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing. And, uh, you know, we'll be back uh, tomorrow evening um, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Konovolov's uh, chat on um, WFN Spine Committee uh, and PSN workshop. And then we have uh, KK Torel on Friday. And on um, Sunday, we have Paulo Pereira from Portugal. So it's a pleasure having all these international uh, celebrities. And, you know, I call Vlad along with that. Now, Pablo has come into that uh, limelight as well. It's wonderful to have you. And we will have more of these um, because I think it's so important to learn anatomy. And I think that is the main thing missing in majority of the young residents. So I think uh, we need to work on that. I'm grateful. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure having you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Vladimir.